Yokohama, September 1st, 1923. A city of liberal ideas, like labor unions, women's rights, and democracy. A city that smells of foreign delights, like chocolate and cigars. A city about to be destroyed. The ground shakes for 14 seconds, and in that time, most of the western concrete buildings collapse, crushing hundreds. And though most traditional buildings are wood, soon fire rages through the city. Dazed survivors stagger around, coated in white dust. But it's not over. A 40-foot tsunami smashes into the coast. Ships are washed down streets and deposited on roofs. Then another wave follows, and another. The sea drowns or sweeps away thousands. Within minutes, Yokohama lays in almost total ruin, and the destruction continues inland to a place only 17 miles from the port city, Tokyo. Thanks so much to Curiosity Stream for helping us share today's historical tale. The destruction rages on. In Tokyo, a city still made largely of wood and rice paper, buildings ignite into district-wide infernos. Fire brigades try to respond, but the tremors have broken all the pipes. In an apocalyptic scene, residents evacuate to a clear area beside a river, but the city around them is a firestorm, and the rising heat combines with the high winds to create a fire whirl the size of a tornado. Of the 140,000 killed, this one freakish accident will account for around 40,000 of them. And for a certain segment of the Japanese right wing, this was divine retribution for Japan flirting with Western ideas, allowing socialists and anarchists to operate and sabotaging the military's achievements abroad in Korea and China. In fact, in the aftermath of the earthquake, mobs hunted and murdered Koreans and anarchists in retribution for the destruction. Now, that might sound strange, but ultranationalist groups had been active in Japan for decades, including some who practiced paramilitary or intelligence activities. Two of the most prominent, the Black Ocean Society and the Black Dragon Society, were especially concerned with countering the threat from neighboring Russia and China. A decade earlier, they had entertained a more pan-Asian view, encouraging and sheltering Sun Yat-sen in the 1911 Chinese Revolution, but they increasingly saw Japan not just as the natural leader of the Asian nations, but its colonial master. And those who believed that military expansion was the key to national and economic security were known as militarists. But in the early 1920s, they were an extreme fringe, and there was no ultra-nationalist or militarist party in the Diet. Between 1912 and 1927, Japan entered a period of reform known as the Taisho Democracy, named after the ruling emperor, and part of that opening of society involved the rise of political parties. Now, there were a lot of parties, but we're going to focus on two today. The Conservative Sayukai, or Association of Friends of Constitutional Government, and the Liberal Kensekai, or Constitutional Politics Association. You actually met the Sayukai last episode. It was the party of Hara Takashi, the prime minister assassinated in a Tokyo train station. They claimed to be liberal, but were really more of a center-right bureaucratic party, believing in big government, large public spending, and opposing social reform programs. They also flirted with the militarist and ultranationalist right, positioning themselves as pro-military and largely in favor of colonialist projects. The Kensakai, by contrast, was a center-left party who backed labor unions, supported economic reforms for farmers, and stood against the rule of oligarchs. Their biggest policy proposal was universal male suffrage, but they'd also been kept out of power by oligarch machinations prevented from forming a government even when they won the majority. And because the conservative Sayukai held the majority from 1900 until just after Hara's assassination in 1921, you'd think the ultra-nationalists would be happy. Well, not so much. For these men, the moderate conservatives were almost as despised as the leftists. See, before Hara, the prime minister was usually a retired general or admiral and extremely friendly to the military. Ultranationalists also hated how Japan had joined the League of Nations after World War I. They thought it was a policy that did nothing but restrain Japan from acting decisively and unilaterally in its own interest. They argued that Hara hadn't even gotten the Paris Peace Conference signatories to affirm a statement of racial equality among the members. The UK and US shot it down. For a period, the ultranationalists got excited at the prospect of the Siberian intervention when Japan joined a multinational force attempting to stabilize the Russian Civil War. The army had hoped to keep Siberia, fashioning it into a buffer state against Russia. But Hara shot that plan down. And when he brought Japanese forces home, the military's perspective was that it wasted 5,000 men without gaining anything. But even after Hara's assassination by an ultranationalist sympathizer, he left them with one final indignity. He'd already dispatched a representative to the Washington Naval Conference. 
In an agreement meant to stop a naval arms race, Japan agreed to limit its navy to a size that Japanese admirals considered insufficient to defend Japan and its colonies. Sure, it was true that China was so divided by warlords at the time, it couldn't mount a naval threat. But the United States had several colonies and naval bases in the Central and Western Pacific. Though that wasn't their biggest worry. It was actually Soviet Russia that scared the ultranationalists most. It was big, powerful, and in one place, only 28 miles from the Japanese home islands. Plus, Russia posed an ideological threat. While Japan had already suppressed the Japanese Communist Party and driven it underground around the turn of the century, ultranationalists always feared it would rise again, especially after 1923, when a communism-influenced student tried to assassinate Crown Prince Hirohito. Revolution, it seemed, was in the air. In 1918, riots over the price of rice had exploded across the country leading to popular violence, labor strikes, and even the bombing of police stations. Plus, the Siberian intervention made things worse, as the government bought stocks of rice to supply its troops. And then, in 1923, the Great Kanto earthquake wrecked both Yokohama and Tokyo. This necessitated a massive rebuilding effort that sucked up government funds, while meanwhile, inflation was squeezing the urban class. And that economic difficulty, and the dissent it caused, helped promote liberal opposition parties like the Kensukai, which won enough seats in 1924 to create a hung parliament and a three-party ruling coalition with the Sayukai. But given how much they had to compromise, the Kensukai's reform plan had to stay moderate. They passed universal male suffrage in 1925, hoping to move the country away from the oligarchs and passed some economic bills. Yet under pressure from their allies, that same year, they also passed the Public Security Prevention Law. This allowed the government to jail anyone for 10 years if they formed or joined an association aimed to alter the Kokutai, the national body with the emperor at its head, or act against private property. Now, it was clearly aimed at communists and socialists, but considering its vague language could come to be used on anyone. But while they had to compromise in the diet, the Kensukai could push a more liberal platform in foreign relations. As foreign minister, the liberal Kijuro Shidehara defined Japanese diplomacy in the 1920s, pursuing amicable relations with Britain and the United States, and non-intervention in China. When trouble occurred, he usually evacuated Japanese citizens rather than sending troops. Even as Chinese nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek, who the ultra-nationalists considered a Russian puppet, consolidated control in China, Shidehara stayed out of it. He refused to join with allied nations in threatening retaliation when Chiang's forces attacked several embassies. But Shidihara's hesitation to use troops, and the government cutting the army by four divisions, angered both the military and the public. Some ultranationalist and junior military officers even started to go as far as saying parliamentary government was un-Japanese. And then, financial panic hit. After the Great Kanto earthquake, the government had offered earthquake bonds to the big banks at a massively discounted rate. The idea being they could lend money to help with the rebuilding. But then by 1927, Japan was in an economic slowdown, and the government floated, making those bonds come due. The result was financial crisis. Citizens made a run on banks, withdrawing their money. Smaller banks collapsed overnight, leaving the market controlled by the big Zaibatsu corporations, many of which had political or family links to members of the Kensukai. Shidihara, for example, was married to a daughter of the man who founded Mitsubishi. It was not a good look, and the prime minister was forced to resign. His Sayukai successor, a general, lost no time in rolling back the tide of liberalism. Within a year, he'd used the Public Security Preservation Law to arrest thousands of known and suspected communists across Japan, and planned for a more aggressive, interventionalist stance in China. It was a new era, quite literally. Because the next year, a new emperor, Hirohito, came to the throne, beginning the Showa period, and radicals in the Imperial Japanese Army would start taking matters into their own hands. Though, speaking of new eras, have you heard about the time a bunch of educational content creators came together to form their own ad-free streaming service called Nebula? Well, now you have! Nebula is our By Creators for Creators streaming service that's home to a ton of our favorite educational entertainers on the internet, such as Princess Weeks, Real Science, and Tierzu. Plus, you get to see some of our Nebula originals on topics like Tipu Sultan and Cowboy Bebop, along with the recent edition of my erroneously titled show, The Only Podcast About Movies, where each week, Shahir Dowd and I discuss a new release or fan-favorite flick most of the time without injuring each other. And because CuriosityStream loves us independent educational creators, they've teamed up with us over at Nebula so that we can offer you a pretty amazing two-for-one deal. Sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description, and you'll get a matching Nebula subscription for free. 
And that's on top of Curiosity Stream's thousands of big budget nonfiction videos and award winning original series curated across their gigantic online learning platform. One of their awesome shows I just finished watching was their highly rated Asian Monarchies Japan, an hour long documentary covering the oldest hereditary monarchy in the world. Like, did you know that the Japanese imperial family dates back to the 6th century BC? Did you? How about you, Rob? Did you know that? So head on over to curiositystream.com slash extra credits to get a subscription to both CuriosityStream and Nebula for 42% off the regular price for the holidays. That's under $12. And at that price, if you're still looking for a last minute holiday gift, well, who doesn't want a bunch of awesome shows to watch for an entire year? Then not only will you be elevating you and your loved ones content watching game, but you'll be directly helping out extra credits in the process, for which we are continually grateful. Have a great holiday season, everyone. A big ol' legendary thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels1 for being so awesome.